OK. So I'll go ahead and get started as people are still rolling in. Um, my name is Boris Rensky. I am a co-founder of Mirantis. And uh, today we'll be talking about making money on OpenStack. Judging by uh, fairly thin attendance, I can say that uh, this is a really a, a problem that uh, bothers the community very deeply. But uh, I'd like to start with uh, um, a little bit um, kind of a detour and uh, talk about uh, you know, um, my credibility with respect to uh, ability to speak on this matter. So as uh, many of you might have guessed, um, I originally am from Russia. I was born in communist Russia uh, back in uh, 81. And uh, if you were to come to uh, the communist Russia back in 81, um, this is kind of a typical picture that you would see. So what this is, is a, it's a piece of crap um, Russian car called Lada, a marvel of uh, you know, the Russian automotive industry. Um, it uh, barely drives, probably eight times out of 10 it wouldn't even start. Um, and uh, the reason I decided to put it up there is to just kind of, uh, um, you know, I think it somewhat symbolizes the quality of life that uh, people had to uh, kind of, you know, sustain back in those days. And, uh, you know, naturally nobody had any money, um, lines to buy bread, things like that. So naturally when uh, in the early 90s, um, a lot of opportunities opened up after communism fell. Um, everybody jumped at the opportunity. And the way people did it is uh, they weren't really so much bothered about, you know, building a disruptive product or, you know, changing the world. People jumped at the opportunity of just making money quickly. Uh, the shortest path to most money is what most people pursued. And uh, now, if you come and visit Moscow today, what you will see is this. <laughs> and uh, I mean, to some extent, I think, uh, and this is actually a real picture, and I don't think that's anything, it's not even special. Um, if, if any of you have been to Moscow, um, you'll actually see a lot of these things. Um, you just need to roam around the city for a couple of days. Um, you know, to some extent, it maybe is a testament that uh, sometimes this kind of mentality uh, can work and can be effective. And I, as somebody who's been, uh, you know, exposed to this transition, and as a Russian person in general, have uh, naturally inherited some of that, you know, I want to make money fast type of, uh, um, you know, approach to uh, dealing with things. And uh, on a completely unrelated note, I'm a, a board member of the OpenStack Foundation, and uh, as such, it's my duty to, uh, you know, attempt and uh, evangelize OpenStack around the world. And when you hear most people trying to evangelize OpenStack today, um, you know, the, the common words that I hear coming out of their mouth is, you know, it's a, it's a great community, let's get together, let's build the best open cloud ever, let's, uh, you know, get together, do kind of meetups and drink beer and write Python code. And uh, when I listen to all of this, I kind of, you know, I imagine this immediately, which is just a bunch of nerds writing Python code which for me, as a guy that comes from Russia, uh, with that money mentality is not very motivating to contribute anything to OpenStack. So what, you know, the, the kind of a point of this uh, whole presentation is to motivate everybody to look at OpenStack through a slightly different prism, and uh, that is a prism of making money. So when I think of OpenStack, I think of this. That stacks of cash that I can make leveraging OpenStack ecosystem. So now, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, you know, I'm a credible person to talk about it. Um, let's dive into it. So there are four key questions that we need to answer um, um, that uh, effectively, you know, are relevant to uh, making money on uh, OpenStack. The first question is, is there money in OpenStack in general? Second is, uh, how much money is there? Um, why OpenStack potentially is a better vehicle to make money than, uh, you know, the alternative stacks or alternative technologies that you might want to kind of invest in? And uh, naturally, the most important question is how is it that you make that money? It's really, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. It's a simple question. Um, you know, if I was presenting at a beer convention, probably I would talk about it a lot. But here, most of you probably already believe that this is the case. Anyway, we can run through the logic really quickly. The logic goes something as follows. 
cloud is big, a lot of money getting invested in cloud, everybody knows it. Um, cloud is open, um, a little bit trickier one, but uh, we'll talk about it. And uh, third, OpenStack is the king of uh, you know, the open cloud ecosystem, which uh, if you put all of these premises together, ultimately translates to uh, you know, probably a good opportunity being there. So cloud is big, everybody knows it. This is uh, actually the data that I pulled off the cloud scaling blog. Randy Bias did the uh, analysis of the Amazon Web Services growth and rack space growth. 100% year-on-year growth in uh, um, infrastructure as a service clouds. I mean, these are kind of impressive statistics. A lot of money being poured in, everybody writing about it. No doubt it's big. Cloud is open. So this one is a little bit more interesting because uh, um, it's a little bit less understood. Um, so when it comes to uh, kind of a cloud paradigm, I think that we're in an interesting territory because if you look at the application infrastructure um, kind of a industry's history, um, the general trend historically has been that uh, open and open source has been just uh, you know, a cheap alternative to proprietary. Typically, the way the industry would move forward, somebody would come up with some you know, disruptive technology, they'll disrupt the market, they'll make a lot of money disrupting it, they'll corner the market, and then some open source alternative will appear that is probably less feature rich, and it's really kind of an attempt to uh, you know, recapture the market that's already been created by somebody else. When it comes to cloud, the picture completely flips because uh, cloud is a kind of a, a baby of the open to a large extent. Um, I mean, cloud has essentially been born, um, the, the term cloud has been pioneered, I think, as we use it today in reference to infrastructure clouds by Amazon. But the idea of uh, cloud, as a lot of people in infrastructure space think of it today, is really a kind of a byproduct of the uh, you know, consumer internet revolution. A lot of companies that had to deal with running applications at massive scale had to completely rethink how they build out their infrastructure stack. They understood that uh, you know, if they were to go uh, the traditional enterprise approach, the uh, license fees that they would have to pay to VMware and Oracle would uh, you know, far outpace the uh, revenue or money that they could ever make. So they built this completely new kind of a open infrastructure. It's either proprietary things that they open sourced or the open source things, existing things that they pulled in. Ultimately, the bottom line here is that they don't pay license fees to anybody. And they've kind of paved the path for the cloud and everybody followed Amazon, you know, actually opened up their um, you know, infrastructure and started selling it as a service, which is where cloud came from, and this is kind of the, the cloud. And the third premise, um, again, a lot of people don't like when I talk about it, um, but I, I am of the subjective opinion that OpenStack has won the open cloud wars. This is a slide that Josh McKenzie from Piston likes to show, average number of developers in an IRC channel. Uh, this is data as of uh, June 18th of this year. But uh, the point is that if you look at uh, just the sheer size of the ecosystem, the number of people that are attending the OpenStack Summit, the number of people involved, it is uh, substantially larger than uh, um, any, any, any other um, ecosystem that is uh, kind of in the same space. Um, another statistic is uh, the just size of the, you know, the foundation, the amount of money that's been committed by the sponsors to the foundation. It is the second largest uh, open source foundation only after Linux itself, which operates at, uh, you know, uh, OpenStack Foundation, six million a year, operating budget, Linux is 9.6. So let's try to tackle a different question, um, a more interesting question, and that is uh, how much money is there in OpenStack? So the first thing to uh, look at is actually, um, you know, what do we mean by money? Uh, money is spent on infrastructure different ways. Um, services, hardware, and software is where most of it. Um, this is uh, the kind of a pie chart representing the traditional um, IT enterprises, enterprise IT spent as it relates to those three categories. Um, so if you look at any kind of sub-segment of the enterprise IT market, there are kind of uh, components uh, that are split between services, hardware, and software in there. Um, so there's many ways to analyze it, and I'm not going to try to uh, convince you that my way is the best, and uh, I think that the point of the exercise is not even to get to the exact number. The point of the exercise is to kind of ballpark it, to understand are we talking about, you know, million dollar, $10 million, billion dollar, trillion dollars. Uh, one way to look at it is uh, 
to look at the existing market that's there. So um, kind of OpenStack is in a new path, but uh, we can try to ballpark it by looking at the market that uh, OpenStack is displacing. So that market right now is largely dominated by VMware, um, at least when it comes to virtualization. There we go. Um, VMware owns roughly 60% of the market. Um, if you look at VMware annual report, they have a line item there that specifically says um, cloud infrastructure licenses. So that's how much licensed software they sell that goes into the cloud infrastructure bucket. That's 1.6 billion for 2011. Um, if that's 60% of the market, we could say that maybe 2.7 billion is the total license component of the cloud infrastructure market. And if you were to add services and hardware to that, uh, leveraging the pie chart from the previous slide, you can ballpark it at about 15 billion. Again, the point is that, you know, nobody really knows how big this market is exactly. Uh, we can, the best we can do is uh, uh, the ballpark, but uh, um, everybody kind of understands that the market is very nice. So why is it better to spend your efforts trying to make money on OpenStack than on Eucalyptus or CloudStack or VMware? Those are fairly viable ecosystems as well. VMware is definitely a much bigger ecosystem, so why OpenStack? Um, the answer boils down to the fact that uh, unlike all the other ecosystems, OpenStack was um, kind of uh, you know, put together by its original founding members with the idea to create the ecosystem. Instead of creating just a piece of software uh, that is open source, that is going to be backed by some one vendor, um, it was envisioned as an ecosystem from day one. And the idea is that it's gonna be an ecosystem that will have a kind of a um, even balance between a lot of participants. There's not gonna be any one vendor protruding and uh, nobody's really gonna be the second citizen to uh, somebody else. It's started by the community. It's being marketed jointly by the community and all the participants. And the, really the goal of the ecosystem is to enable all the participants to kind of make money on that ecosystem. If you look at the alternatives, um, I mean, they're all about a single vendor. So they're all started by a single vendor. The goal is to create the ecosystem around which the uh, uh, single vendor can reap the benefits and there's, it's, it's impossible to be, you know, uh, a eucalyptus player, um, yet uh, be better at eucalyptus than eucalyptus. And it goes the same way for, for CloudStack, and it goes the same way for VMware, so it's much harder. And uh, the idea behind their, you know, the, the idea behind kind of even open sourcing some of these products to begin with, in my opinion, is not so much about uh, creating the community, uh, but uh, about kind of, you know, throwing this uh, veil of no vendor lock-in. So vendor lock-in is this issue that a lot of people are concerned about. You know, I want to have no vendor lock-in, and a lot of people just kind of tend to associate no vendor lock-in with open source. So if you're open source, no vendor lock-in, you're good. So, you know, if you take Eucalyptus or you take CloudStack, you make it open source, you make it even Apache, even better. It's open source, definitely no vendor lock-in, and that's the end goal, less so to really create the ecosystem. And that's just my personal opinion. Um, so now the most important and interesting question, and that's uh, how do you actually get the money uh, that's uh, out there? So you can kind of split this up into a, you know, a series of sub-questions. And uh, the first question is, uh, um, who do you actually sell to? Uh, to be able to make money, naturally you have to understand who your customer is. And uh, for OpenStack, this kind of changes as the ecosystem evolves. So what I tried to do is I tried to put together a simple graph. On uh, the y-axis, we have uh, kind of a, the risk of adopting OpenStack. And by adopting here, I'm speaking kind of, a, of adoption in a broad sense. It can either be you know, deploying it if you are an enterprise, or it can be actually you know, starting to try to integrate your products with it if you're an infrastructure vendor. It can be a lot of things, but basically touching OpenStack. So what is the risk? And not so surprisingly, the risk over time goes down. I specifically plotted the time, 2010, when OpenStack was first started, and 2017 is kind of a long enough horizon for us to uh, uh, kind of be able to see the whole cycle of adoption. So the first year when OpenStack was started initially, it was a lot of, it is true, it was a lot of vendor-driven hype. 
Um, it was a lot of vendors that felt that maybe they're a little bit late in the cloud game that, you know, attaching themselves to the OpenStack bandwagon is a good strategy. And they started investing a lot of money in uh, integrating their existing solutions with OpenStack in some way. So that as OpenStack ecosystem develops and uh, there is market pool, their solutions get pulled in. Some companies just, you know, would build drivers to, you know, to have storage work with uh, Nova Volume. Some companies would build an entire strategy that would be kind of more all-encompassing. But uh, the bottom line is it's infrastructure vendors like HP, like Cisco, like IBM that started spending money on doing something with OpenStack. And that's really been kind of the exclusive trend for the first year, at least as we at Mirantis have observed it. And uh, a lot of our early customer base is uh, exactly from that segment. Now, uh, the second part of it is service providers and internet application vendors. And this is where we are today, I think. And this is where we will remain for a little while. So, uh, we'll go over kind of the motivations of each of these, uh, you know, potential customer segments um, in uh, subsequent slides. And the third, and I don't think anybody argues of it, the most conservative adopters is the enterprise. I personally don't think that, uh, you know, there's been, um, you know, any significant adoption of OpenStack or any cloud platform, so to speak, uh, in enterprise at all whatsoever right now. And I think that we're looking at the horizon past 2014 for some real adoption to take place. <coughs> so, you know, if you try to layer kind of the sizes to this subsequent, to, to this kind of a market segment, then naturally the infrastructure vendor is going to be doing most of the stuff themselves. Maybe they'll buy some services. They spend a little bit of money. Um, tackling a little bit more of a strategic problem for the service providers and internet application vendors. So a little bit more money. And the common thinking is that it's the enterprise, that's when the uh, big bucks start rolling in. So let's look at uh, each one of these in a little bit more detail. Infrastructure vendors, what's the use case? Why the infrastructure vendors um, really spending money on this? Um, like I said, to uh, basically not get commoditized and to ride the cloud hype. Uh, you want to differentiate around cloud. You want to integrate with OpenStack, and that's really the use case that uh, a lot of them are kind of trying to solve for. Um, so what is it that you can sell to each one of the segments? So if it comes to uh, infrastructure vendors, the only thing you can really sell to infrastructure vendor is services. It's unlikely that you can kind of bundle your OpenStack and sell it to an infrastructure vendor. It's unlikely that you can sell, you know, OpenStack support to somebody like HP, for instance. Um, and uh, the original kind of uh, first year wave is uh, pretty much exclusively services driven. As we move into the service providers, internet application vendors, there are two different use cases. One use case for service providers, another one for internet application vendors. But uh, I bundled them together into the same bucket because I think that from the standpoint of adoption for both of these categories, it is happening at the same time. So for service providers, uh, naturally the use case is, hey, cloud is big, Amazon you know, found a, a pot of gold, we want to do the same, let's build Amazon, let's use OpenStack for it. So that's kind of you know, the general uh, the bottom lining for service providers. Internet application vendors, most of the use cases we've seen so far are kind of twofold. One is dev test scenario, uh, you know, build a cloud to, uh, you know, in a kind of continuous deployment environment which, uh, you know, would integrate with, uh, you know, OpenStack and you can do your development more efficiently. But the more interesting scenario, and this kind of maps very well onto the uh, WebEx case study, which is, you know, WebEx is the second largest SaaS vendor in the world they were presenting. So they fall into the second bucket. And uh, that bucket is uh, trying to replace kind of their, you know, spaghetti-like um, infrastructure that has haphazardly evolved, uh, you know, over the course of the company's evolution with something that is more or less standard. So not, not every SaaS vendor or, you know, internet application vendor was as smart about building their infrastructure as Google, for instance. So they were kind of gradually evolving it, you know, patching and stuff like that as uh, their solution was getting adopted. And uh, a lot of them today have ended up with this kind of, you know, very weird kind of spaghetti-like infrastructure that is not very central. They have pieces of VMware, pieces of uh, kind of, uh, you know, other open infrastructure solutions, and they have to kind of develop and build their, uh, you know, um, application level logic against this weird infrastructure. It's very hard to maintain. 
um, and OpenStack is potentially a standard that can replace it, so let's kind of do a project and step-by-step step replace all of this weird infrastructure of something that's gonna be one beautiful and elegant solution. So what can you sell to these guys? Again, um, I think that most of the stuff that you can sell to these guys um, is services, but we are seeing the emergence of, uh, you know, some, some possibilities for selling some of the products. Um, you would not be able to package OpenStack and sell your own distro of OpenStack, in my opinion, to a service provider or guys like WebEx. Um, but uh, um, you can kind of find some uh, components that might be of value to those organizations, which they'd be willing to pay you, uh, you know, a subscription for, or um, you know, kind of a support-like model um, 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 that will, you know, solve things for them. So we're kind of starting to see some emergence of, uh, you know, opportunities to build a leveraged business model at this stage. And uh, finally, the enterprises. Um, again, like I don't think we are we are really there yet. Um, I think we're just scratching the surface at this point. Um, from the standpoint of the enterprise, the use case for something like OpenStack naturally is, you know, embrace the new paradigm of open efficient infrastructure versus the old paradigm of, uh, you know, um, database automation infrastructure that is largely powered by VMware. So displace VMware is really the bottom line. Um, and what you can sell to enterprises, you can sell pretty much everything because uh, unlike for the two categories that we talked about in the past, for enterprises, for most enterprises anyway, the uh, you know, IT or application infrastructure component of IT is rarely seen as a core competence and they're willing to pay money to third party vendors to uh, solve their problems for them in that space. So you can sell engineering services, you can sell managed services for instance, like uh, what Rackspace is trying to do uh, with their private cloud model, um, you know, just you know, build a cloud and we'll operate the cloud for you inside your firewall. Um, you can sell support subscription like uh, Red Hat does it. You can sell you know, a whole bunch of tools around, such as you know, monitoring tools, deployment tools, et cetera, et cetera. And you can sell appliances and hardware. So you, know, you can imagine selling something like a, you know, a V block only running OpenStack, for instance. I'm sure that uh, enterprises might be interested in that. So the question that I have, and I don't have an answer for it, but uh, the question that uh, I have and I think that's worth pondering is that, uh, you know, in the earlier slide we made this assumption that uh, uh, the money is in the uh, enterprise market. Um, so, but we see two trends. First trend is uh, kind of, you know, enterprises being very slow at adopting, you know, the new paradigm of infrastructure, the cloud paradigm, and we consciously pushed them off into kind of, you know, 2014, 2017. Uh, time frame. Um, and the second trend is that as time passes, what we're observing is that enterprises are really less and less interested um, in uh, really spending money on building out their own internal um, IT infrastructure uh, as it pertains to the infrastructure layer, definitely. So, the, you know, the, the, the good trends to look at is just, you know, the uh, complete obliteration of the uh, on premise uh, enterprise software with uh, the SaaS model, so on-premise enterprise software is dead. Everybody in the enterprise software market agrees with it. Um, it's simply not growing, and SaaS software is just taking off and expected to you know, grow even faster. And uh, given that about 50% of the enterprise infrastructure spend is uh, somehow attached to the uh, enterprise software spend, uh, ultimately that means that uh, enterprise is gonna be spending less money on building out their own infrastructure. Another trend that is kind of, you know, puzzling or, no, uh, not puzzling, but, but kind of pointing in the same direction is the adoption of uh, AWS, so infrastructure as a service solutions. And uh, if you put these two trends together, um, enterprises being really slow and being kind of at the tail end of adopting cloud infrastructure, and the other trend is, uh, um, you know, this tendency of enterprises to spend less on their internal infrastructure to begin with. The question is really how much money is going to be there in that market um, you know, when enterprises are finally ready to uh, adopt cloud-like infrastructure at mass. And again, I don't have an answer for it, but uh, I think it's something worth thinking about. So moving on to the next section, let's talk a little bit about the ecosystem. In, uh, you know, we've covered the theory part of, uh, you know, how potentially one could make money in OpenStack. Um, another good exercise to do is to look at how other companies are trying to make money in OpenStack. Um, so, 
I like to uh, think of it in terms of scale. If you look at the entire OpenStack ecosystem, you can align almost all companies along a certain scale. And uh, on one side of that scale, you will have companies that are trying to uh, uh, kind of attach themselves to OpenStack ecosystem, but on the other hand, uh, uh, their message is more of a traditional kind of a proprietary message. Uh, so they're easier to, to adopt, very kind of out of the box, just take me, push the button, and it magically works. But uh, there's a lot of proprietary components and you maybe have to buy you know, hardware licenses. On the other side of the scale are the companies that are you know, kind of more embracing the OpenStack momentum, the open part of it, and saying, okay, OpenStack is a platform, maybe we'll sell you services, maybe we'll sell you some tools, but we're not gonna be selling anything proprietary. And if you look at the existing ecosystem, you can have these four camps. There's a hardware camp, software camp, support camp, and system integration camp. Hardware camp largely kind of airing on the proprietary side, system integration services camp being, you know, on the open side of it. And the players align something like this. Um, and let's just move forward and examine each one of these sub camps in a little bit more detail. So the hardware camp, and I'm not making a statement that one camp necessarily is better than the other here. I'm just saying that they have a different properties and all of them will map differently uh, in terms of, uh, you know, their ability to sell against that, uh, you know, OpenStack maturity curve that we looked at. Um, hardware camp, it's very much aligned with enterprise buying patterns. Enterprises like buying solutions that are out of the box and complete and are kind of simple and push button and they're there. Uh, they buy hardware, there's a big existing market for it. You can sell for channel, you can build a leveraged business model. Um, so the, the upside of being in that camp is fairly sizable. The cons of that camp is that uh, it's very hard to penetrate the market because uh, enterprises, you know, are used to buying from their incumbent uh, hardware vendors as it comes to infrastructure. It's known to be, you know, very segmented. Um, and uh, it requires a fairly significant R&D investment up front to really put together a piece of hardware, of software that runs on it, just a lot of things you have to put together to make them work and make them work nice. Some of the key players in the camp, uh, Nebula, which maybe most of you, well, I, I'm sure most of you know, their positioning is, uh, you know, we are the iPhone of the cloud, so they are like the Uber guys on the Uber proprietary side. They're, you know, it's like a magic box that runs some magic software that is somewhat OpenStack, but unclear how OpenStack it is, and you plug in your infrastructure to it, and you orgasm as you see it turn into a cloud. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the hardware camp, uh, Moving a little bit to the open side, you have uh, another player called Morph Labs, also hardware, but uh, their plays like best performance, price performance, commodity components, um, and uh, they're generally kind of more open, so they're more aligned with the open message. And naturally, you have all the incumbents. Everyone has their own approach, but they're all there, and they're trying to ride the uh, uh, you know, OpenStack wave to somehow creatively package bundle solutions that somehow tie together with OpenStack. Software camp, um, it's, you know, pretty much the, the pros and cons of it are really just less pronounced pros and cons of the um, hardware camp, I think. Um, it's a little bit less of an R&D investment. Um, you can still build a leveraged business model. The cons is that uh, it's somewhat hard to penetrate that market because uh, enterprises are not used to buying, you know, pistons. They are used to buying VMware and they're not used to buying cloud, they're used to buying data center automation, so you have to invest a lot of money to uh, change that mentality and it's enterprise sales process expensive and hard. Um, although you can sell through uh, uh, VARs, um, you can't expect VARs to ever create demand for you. So, uh, you know, they, 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 might, they might help resell maybe pieces of hardware with your software bundled into it, but unless everybody knows about it and wants to buy it to begin with, you won't see, you know, guys like uh, Ingram Micro, for instance, you know, selling, okay, this is like a Dell appliance with, you know, piston running on it, buy, buy, buy. So as long as somebody's asking for it, they'll give it, but otherwise, um, you know, the, the kind of a battle against the uh, existing brand perceptions is on you. Um, to quickly gloss over the uh, key players, so cloud scaling, their angle is uh, we have the OpenStack distro for um, really large scale deployments, telcos and large scale deployments for the enterprises, so large scale web scale is their angle. Piston, uh, VMware killer, that's kind of their business model. We are the enterprise OpenStack that will kill VMware. 
Swift stack exclusively focused on uh, Swift. And stack ops, um, I think they're based out of Spain. Uh, fairly popular, uh, their focus up until recently has been uh, on a kind of a really small uh, uh, use cases. So if I have like, you know, two, four nodes, and, but I want things to work really quickly and push the button, uh, that's what you get. Now they released the Enterprise Edition, having amassed a good amount of popularity, so it's uh, uh, arguably not a bad play. Support camp, all you see is, uh, you know, the incumbents. I won't spend too much time on this one. Um, the points I wanted to underline here is that, uh, you know, as we're moving away from the hardware and software camp, we're moving into the paradigm of companies and services that are being offered that, in my opinion, are much better aligned with the existing OpenStack momentum. So existing OpenStack momentum is very much about open, and if you're tying your messaging to OpenStack, you're saying, I am an OpenStack appliance or I am an OpenStack distro. It has to be that, uh, you know, you're consistent all the way. Um, and uh, selling hardware and licensed software uh, with the OpenStack message is a little bit hard, but doing something like a Red Hat support model with OpenStack, that I can imagine kind of working uh, because that is simply, you know, it's aligned with uh, people's perceptions. So when they come to OpenStack, they have certain perceptions, and when you tell them we'll sell you support, it makes sense. If you tell them we're gonna sell you software license, it makes less sense. Key players, like I said, the incumbents. Um, most of you probably know the positioning. Canonical, they are the, you know, the Linux for the cloud. You know, all of the cloud uh, providers and all the guests in the cloud are all you know, Ubuntu Linux. That's the messaging. Red Hat, naturally, we own the enterprise. We own the open source ecosystem. We're gonna you know, uh, conquer the world of OpenStack now. And SUSE's their angle is uh, Linux for mission critical applications, such as, for example, I think like 70% of SAP workloads run on SUSE and a lot of other mission critical stuff. So they're mission critical angle. Rackspace uh, is also somewhat in this camp. Uh, at least until recently, their messaging has been fanatical support. We are the you know, hosting company that does fanatical support, but it doesn't matter if we're doing fanatical support on hosting, we can also do fanatical support on supporting your software. So that's kind of been the angle. Um, they're slightly moved away from this uh, at this point, but uh, I think kind of the general messaging is still largely the same. And the SI camp, uh, you sell services. Uh, some pros is that uh, you can start monetizing immediately. So as soon as you sell your first account, you start making money. Um, it naturally you know, makes full use of OpenStack momentum because you're not introducing any kind of products or agendas that might conflict with uh, you know, the existing kind of incumbent OpenStack messaging. And the good thing also is that you get exposed to a lot of opportunities um, and you can learn about uh, uh, you know, customers' buying patterns as they relate to the OpenStack ecosystem as you engage in real projects. The big two cons of this uh, approach is uh, that business scales linearly. There is no way to build a leveraged business model on services. And uh, this business is very short-lived because uh, eventually it will get commoditized and uh, that'll be the end of our OpenStack value in the context of the services play. So I'd like to kind of close by sharing the uh, Mirantis story. Uh, we've talked about uh, kind of the theory of making money on OpenStack. We looked at how, you know, other players are trying to make money on OpenStack, at least as uh, you look at them from the outside in. And uh, now I can share with you the story um, of how we try to make money on OpenStack. And that's kind of a story from inside out. So the story is fairly simple, and it goes something as follows. Uh, before OpenStack, uh, started, and before we got, you know, deeply involved in it about 18 months ago, we were somewhat of a, you know, generic application infrastructure services company. Uh, anything that's cool in application infrastructure, such as, you know, big data or eucalyptus, cloud.com, solar and lucene, we get our hands on and we try to uh, kind of build buckets of expertise. And we're able to, you know, more or less sustain the business and make money that way. Uh, when OpenStack came about, um, we said, ooh, another cool thing. Uh, how about we play with that? Uh, we played with it. Uh, it was bare release, actually. What we did is uh, we uh, took it and we deployed it private cloud for our internal IT. Um, I mean, the bare release was buggy. It was horrible. It was not easy to do. But we did like the uh, kind of the, the layered architecture approach. 
And uh, we also liked naturally the amount of market hype and community momentum that was there. So we said, okay, uh, we want to explore this a little bit further. So what I did is uh, I called Mark Collier, who is now the uh, CEO of the OpenStack Foundation, and said, hey, you know, we kind of want to get involved and see if we can explore this further. Mark was at Rackspace then. He was a very busy guy. So he said, I don't know you, Boris. Don't talk to me. Talk to Lauren Sell. She deals with fools like you. <laughs> so I talked to Lauren, and Lauren said, okay, what you guys should do is, uh, if you want to get involved, how about you make a meetup, the Bay Area local meetup for OpenStack. We have a kind of a hacker meetup, she said, but uh, we really want to do a business-oriented meetup uh, that is focused on kind of, you know, the business ecosystem and potential end users. Uh, that's an opportunity for you. How about you do this? So we said, yay, let's do this. And we figured we're going to do a kind of a meetup of 20 people uh, showing up. Um, got a small room. We ended up with 120 people showing up and had to upgrade the room two times. Um, and shortly after the meetup, some interesting things started happening. Kind of the ecosystem learned a little bit that there is a, a company that is doing services uh, in OpenStack. So we started literally getting inbound interest. Randy Bias, whom uh, some of you may know, called and said, oh, you guys do services around OpenStack. Can you please help us out? Um, you know, we have, you know, we do a lot of OpenStack stuff. We could really use a partner. And then Ray O'Brien, who is a CIO at NASA at a time, uh, who ran the Nebula project, uh, called us and he said, hey, Boris, you know, I see you doing uh, OpenStack stuff. All of my guys left to uh, do their own startups like Nebula and Piston. And uh, I don't have anybody to support my uh, OpenStack infrastructure. Do you guys know anything about it? Can you help me out? So I said, yes. And then some other people from Nexenta that you don't know have also called us and said, OpenStack is cool and we want to integrate with it. Do it for us. And these are not the only three, but that kind of gives you the trend. Uh, so we started looking at it and uh, I came to the rest of the company shareholders and I said that, uh, you know, guys, this is kind of an interesting trend. How about we now focus on OpenStack? And they looked at it and said, no, it's too risky, it's too narrow, uh, bad idea. We, we'll be cloud services company. We won't be an OpenStack company. And I said, well, cloud services, that doesn't make any sense. Who's going to buy cloud services? It doesn't, I don't understand it. And they said, well, yeah, that's just because you're young and stupid, so <laughs> stop talking to us. So what we did is we decided to call a professional marketing consultant, Geva Perry, uh, whom again, many of you might know, and we asked them, you know, uh, we're seeing some trend here that, you know, people want us for OpenStack, what should we do? At the same time, we have all this legacy business, we're doing all this great Hadoop stuff and big data stuff and all this stuff. I mean, we don't want to change our messaging. He said, no, what you should do is you should focus on OpenStack, you should make a website that says that you're all OpenStack, buy some Google AdWords to point to the OpenStack stuff, you know, do some more meetups and write some more blogs about OpenStack and it's going to be cool. So I shared that sentiment and uh, um, I kind of brought his recommendation to the management and they said, oh, now the marketing consultant said it, not you, a uh, young, stupid fool. All right, let's do it. So what we did is uh, we changed our website. <laughs> we bought a bunch of Google AdWords uh, that pointed to it. It was no longer cloud services. It was now OpenStack. And now we uh, kind of grew to be, uh, you know, the big kahuna in the OpenStack services. Uh, so we are, the, you know, one of the, spo one of the sponsors of the foundation. Um, we arguably, um, I'm pretty sure that it's true because I know the ecosystem. We are the largest services player in the ecosystem. Uh, we have already, already 70, actually, people that are exclusively dedicated to doing OpenStack projects. We've done already at this point close to 30 OpenStack-related projects. Um, you know, some are for fairly notable customers, such as WebEx that presented a keynote this morning, and uh, we've been growing at uh, about 100% per year since uh, we committed to OpenStack. So that's our story. Thank you. And I'm open to questions if anybody wants to ask them. But you don't have to if you don't. So 